today's uh, our, our uh, GTB invited speaker this Thursday. So this is uh, Dr. Marjorie Weber. So she's a professor at, at uh, Michigan State. And Marjorie is, uh, I think you've been there for about two and a half years or so. And she's, she did her PhD at Cornell. We just missed each other. Uh, she then went on to UC Davis, where she was a Center for Population Biology postdoc. Uh, she's gone, she won a lot of really good awards. She's into the American the, uh, Young Investigator Prize from American Society of Natural a few years ago. She's currently a, uh, a fellow from the, a early career fellow from the Ecological Society of America. And she's done a lot of very cool work involving plant insect interactions, the evolution of plant pollinator interactions, uh, anti herbivory defenses, and sort of thinking about all those things in a macroevolutionary and phylogenetic comparative framework. So she's very much a leader at thinking about, about the intersection of plant insect ecology and interactions in a macroevolutionary sense. So thinking about phylogenetically speciation extinction as well as local kinds of ecological interactions. And presumably that's some of what she's gonna tell us about today. She also has a, a uh, lab that is, that is actively involved in a number of aspects of promoting diversity and inclusion in science. So along with one of her postdocs, they are the home of uh, Project Biodiversify, which develops a lot of resources for, te for, uh, for teaching that focus on diversity and inclusion, um, positive role model promotion within science and so on. And I guess with that, I'll turn it over to you to tell us about mutualisms on the tree of life. Yeah, okay, is this working? Oh, feedback. Uh, thank you, Dan, so much for inviting me here. Um, and for all of you for coming. Is it really bad? If it starts to make a terrible sound, make a face. So do, is it, yeah, I'll, I'll move slightly this way. Is this good? Okay, you're coming to help me. Okay. <laughs> um, great. Okay, anyway, um, I was really excited to come to uh, University of Michigan. I um, you know, grew up really close to here in Detroit, and then now I work at MSU, so I'm sort of back in town. Um, and it's just really nice to meet um, a bunch of you and make connections here, so we're kind of neighbors, um, and it's nice to, to be neighborly and to know you, so. Um, I was also really excited to, uh, as you can tell, to get to talk on Valentine's Day because I study mutualism, um, and I like geeked out about my title and my um, like cool art here. Um, and then, but I was thinking when I was driving here, I was telling the graduate students this at lunch, but I was thinking when I was driving here like about my title and about mutualisms, and I was thinking like, wow, you know, mutualisms, it's kind of romantic that I'm talking about mutualisms on Valentine's Day, but well, like the current, lore about mutualisms is that they're actually like reciprocal exploitation um, and that there's like a cost of participating and it just has to like the benefit has to outweigh the cost or whatever so um, I don't know if it's actually like love but um, I don't know. Okay um, so before I start uh, I just wanted to plug the project that Dan um, nicely brought up which is this project, Pro project Biodiversify that's in our lab. If any of you are um, educators, uh, if you're gonna be teaching big classes and would like to get more diverse examples of role models into your classroom, or if you would like um, to be a role model that we highlight um, in classrooms, please uh, come and talk to me or check out our website because um, that's our, our sort of mission. Okay, so uh, aside from human, my interest in you know, promoting human diversity in STEM, um, my, my, my primary interest um, and what I'm paid to actually do is to study uh, biological diversity and not human diversity. So um, the biological diversity on our planet, obviously, um, is astounding and incredible. Um, and a lot of us are in this room today because we were inspired by um, that biodiversity. So um, it's pretty incredible, you know, that it's like our day jobs that are sort of paid every day to think about this question. So how did these incredible forms um, of diversity come to be on our planet? So, so this is a question um, that many of us ask. So when you ask this question, uh, one common thing that you might think about are species interactions. So the way that things look today um, are due in part to how they've interacted with other organisms over their lifetime. And this has been part of driving the diversity of our planet, these complex species interactions. Um, and this, I, this like shouldn't shock you, this idea. It's been around for a long time. Like Darwin was very, um, this, this was an idea close to his heart, um, this idea that speci species interactions influence the evolution of diversity. Um, so, yeah, so the way that things interact 
shape their evolutionary trajectories over time, and the, the diversity that results from evolution shapes how things can interact now. So there's this feedback. Um, so we're sort of used to thinking about this feedback conceptually, uh, but when we actually try and test it, we run into a lot of problems, right? Uh, and that's because these things um, are happening at very different scales. So species interactions are really complex and they change over short temporal or spatial scales, like any ecologist will, will tell you that. Whereas um, macroevolution, the, the evolution of diversity on a grand scale, is something that we're talking about over whole clades um, or whole species. So things that are happening over, over thousands and millions and um, tens and hundreds of millions of years. So connecting these things um, is challenging. And so for most of the hypotheses linking um, ecology and macroevolution, a lot of them um, remain challenging to test. <clears throat> and this has led to this quote that I like from Dave Jablonski that says, um, despite the enormous literature on biotic interactions in modern and ancient systems, biotic factors uh, remain poorly understood as macroevolutionary agents. So this was, what, 10 years ago, um, a little over 10 years ago, but I, I, I'd argue that we're still sort of um, continuing to be in this zone. So this is the question that motivates the research in my lab. Um, how strong is the link between species interactions and the evolution of diversity on our planet? Um, and uh, I like to focus on plant arthropod interactions for, for that, but today I'm gonna, because it's Valentine's Day, um, I'm gonna focus specifically on plant arthropod mutualisms, um, which are very near and dear to my heart. Okay. So th I'm gonna talk about two different types of, um, of ecological interactions of mutualisms today. For the first part of the talk, uh, I'm gonna talk about these defense mutualisms between plants and arthropods, and that's gonna take up the bulk of the talk. And then, like, because it was Valentine's Day, I couldn't help but squeeze in the, the, um, a, a bit about orchid bees at the, at the end, which is, oh, that's fun. <laughs> um, which is also part of my research. I can still see it, but I could give like a chalk talk. Um, does anyone have any suggestions about what I should do? Your computer's not asleep. No, my computer's not asleep. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> All right, ready? I'm glad you guys are here. No, this one's still. Yeah. Yeah. Well, does anyone want to tell me what a plant arthropod defense mutualism is? Now I can make you do like weird think pair share and all sorts of like teaching. I teach like a 200 person ecology class, so I'm, I'm used to this. Does anyone know? Yeah, the bullhorn acacia and the ants, that's exactly right. So a plant arthropod um, uh, mutualism is a situation where a plant is being protected by an arthropod, in that case, ants, um, and they are, um, in turn, the ants are in turn eating enemies of the plant, so herbivores. Um, so that results in a mutualism because the, the plant is getting defense from um, the ant, and the ant is getting some sort of reward from the plant. Um, oh, thanks. I think I've switched settings, so just okay. I guess stay right in there. Okay, I won't oh. flail, flail <laughs> okay. wildly over there. Okay, so let's see here. Where was I? Okay, so then I'm going to talk about orchid bees. So let's start with plant bodyguard defense mutualisms, which I just started describing, but let's start again. Okay, so say you're a plant in the world, and you're being um, attacked by an enemy. So here, a very hungry caterpillar. There are lots of ways, I mean, maybe not just a caterpillar, but also like a, um, a fungus, say. Here's pottery mildew. Um, there are lots of ways that you can defend yourself against these enemies if you're a plant, and lots of ways have evolved. But one way um, that has evolved many, many times in plants is to offer up some sort of trait, some sort of phenotype that's a reward. Um, and that reward is given to the third trophic level. Here's some ants and mites. Um, so those ants and mites then put top-down pressure on the herbivores, or the plant enemies, um, and thereby reducing damage to the plant. So this is a mutualism, like I was saying, because the bodyguards get some reward via this phenotype, and then the plant gets um, defended uh, indirectly via these interactions with the, the enemies. Okay, 
So that's the, the, um, the interaction I'm going to talk about first. And the traits, the evolution that I'm going to talk about are that the macroevolutionary patterns um, of these traits that attract and reward these bodyguards. All right. So I'm going to talk about two particular um, bodyguard reward traits today, the evolution of extrafloral nectaries, which are a food reward, and then mite domatia, which are a housing reward. So I'm going to quickly tell you about that uh, natural history of those traits. OK. So first, extrafloral nectaries. These are, these are nectaries. They're glands that secrete nectar. Um, but they're extrafloral. They're found outside of the flower. Um, and these glands, um, we believe, are adaptive solely to attract bodyguards, not to attract um, pollinators. So they look like this. They're very diverse. And they attract and provide food for a wide array of different species. They're kind of open for business. But we've primarily studied them as, as attractants to ants in the bottom left, which are good bodyguards. OK, so that's the first trait. The second trait are these mite domatia. So here's a little video um, of mite domatia. So these are structures on the undersides of leaves. Um, and if you zoom in and look at them and then like use your phone through a microscope um, and, and look in the structures, you see that they're full of mites. Um, OK, you can like agitate them, and they'll, they'll run around and stuff. <laughs> so um, these were first described by this guy uh, named Axel Lundstrom. He was a Swedish botanist, and he was about 40 years old um, in the 1880s when he described them. And he said, um, I saw these structures, and they're full of mites. And I'm going to call them domatia. This is where the word domatia comes from, not the ants, the mites. I'm going to call them domatia from the Latin word domus meaning home. Um, and he's, he looked at them a bunch, and he said, you know, I think these things mediate a mutualism between mites and um, plants. And his idea was like that the plants offered the mites a home in that little chamber, and then the mites were protecting the plants, um, just like the ants in the, um, in the acacia. But th they didn't, they weren't, yeah, just like that. OK, so um, he put this forward. And people um, laughed at him. They were like, no, that's absolutely not happening. Um, there was a very t like a time of studying um, you know, adverse inter interactions. People were like, no, the mites in there are um, eating the plant. Like, it's bad. It's not a mutualism. <clears throat> but um, when you look at these things and you look inside, you see whole families of mites in there. And you see that the mites that are in there are almost exclusively either predators um, or uh, microvores. So they're, they're either eating like fungi and bacteria, or they're eating um, tiny herbivores. They're not eating the plant. And so about 100 years later, after a bunch of blocking and removing experiments, there's very, very clear evidence that these, um, these traits are mutualisms. So here's sort of what it would look like today. Um, he was never like vindicated in his life, but it's true. <clears throat> OK, so when he first described these things, he described them as bearded vein axles, because they do look like a little beard. Um, but we now know that they can take on a wide diversity of forms across the plant tree of life. OK, and here's an example of one that's not a tuft. It's more of a, um, a pit. And you can see the mite in there and the little mite egg and the little mite home. OK, great. So um, I love both of these traits, but why am I sort of interested in them um, in terms of my research? Well, there's for a couple of reasons. The first is that uh, these two bodyguard traits are present in thousands and thousands of plant families. So um, they've evolved many times across the tree of life. Extrafloral nectaries are in like 25% of, of vascular plant families. Domatia are in like 30% of uh, woody plant species. If you walk outside and look at a, the leaf of a woody plant, deciduous plant species here, they'll be on um, 30% of the species around here. So they're very common. Um, so they've evolved over and over, but their only known function is defensive. It's rewarding these arthropod bodyguards. Um, they've had this like really rich ecological history of study, but they've been very rarely um, examined in a phylogenetic way. So there's all these hypotheses from the literature about their ecology, when they're good, when they're bad, when they should be selected for, when they should be selected against, but it hasn't really been tested in a phylogenetic context much. So that's what I wanted to do. Um, so for these projects, I like to go into the ecological literature and ask those questions, pull out hypotheses that have macroevolutionary predictions um, from, based on their ecology. So I'm going to talk to you about a couple of those today. So the first hypothesis um, is that these traits are geographical adaptations. Um, so in particular, that 
Extra floral nectaries um, are tropical adaptations. They evolved repeatedly in the tropics. Um, and they've actually been touted as an uh, um, example of the biotic interactions hypothesis, so a hypothesis about why we have a latitudinal diversity gradient. Um, but they're thought of as tropical adaptations. But nobody's ever looked to actually see if they evolve more in the tropics. Um, Domatia, on the other hand, have been thought of as a temperate um, adaptation. So people have found them more around here. Um, they think that they're a temperate adaptation, but that also has not been tested in a phylogenetic context to look at their origin. Okay, that's the first hypothesis. The second is that um, these two mutualistic defensive traits are costly um, and they're redundant. So they should trade off. Like you either go in for one or the other, like mites or ants, um, and not both. And the third hypothesis that I, um, I wanted to test was that they increase lineage diversification rates in the plants that have them. Are these, they're these novel defenses um, that are sort of key innovations and increase the, um, the net lineage diversification rate of those lineages. And they're thought to be um, key innovations because they're believed to sort of broaden the plant's defensive repertoire, which um, expands where they can live. It expands their realized niche and allows colonization of these new habitats where they can experience conditions ripe for radiation more often. Okay, great. So, um, so I set out to test these hypotheses, the geographic adaptation, the trade-off, and the diversification hypothesis in this wonderful genus of plants called viburnum. Who has a viburnum in their garden? They're common around here, garden, oh, great. Hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, viburnum is a genus of about 170 shrubs and trees um, that's very widespread and has had a lot of uh, evolution happen in its leaf form. So it's a great uh, group to test this hypothesis. It also has extra floral nectaries and mitomatia um, present and absent across the genus, which is also necessary for testing some of these. Okay. Um, and to test them, I took, I took an integrative approach, which is like generally what I do in my research, is um, I merge this comparative phylogenetic approach uh, where we look at phylogenies and we ask whether the phylogenetic patterns are consistent with the ecological predictions. Um, and then I follow that up with experiments where, um, where I ask whether any sort of new interpretations of the phylogenetic patterns are consistent with what we're seeing in the eco like ecological function of the traits. Does that make sense? So pairing phylogenetic methods with ecological experiments. Okay, I'm mostly talking about phylogenetics today. Uh, here's the phylogeny that we were working with. It was in collaboration with um, this team at Yale, Michael Donahue and Wendy Clement. And the first thing that we did was we scored everything for um, various ecological factors um, about the plant. So for instance, climate, leaf production strategy, things like that. Um, then what we did was score the entire genus as best as we could for um, the presence or absence um, and type of traits that they had. So we did this all using museum specimens, um, herbarium specimens of pressed plants. <clears throat> okay, so the first thing that we found was that viburnum contained um, several different forms of both extra floral nectaries and domatia. So these bodyguard traits were fairly diverse across this one genus. So they had, um, um, they took on a variety of different forms. They had those beards, they had the pits, they had um, extra floral nectaries in various places around the leaf. Um, and that was great because a lot of the variation that we see across the tree of life, we are seeing sort of pop up within this one genus, so we were really excited about that. Okay, so for the first hypothesis, to remind you, it was that these mutualistic defensive traits um, are geographical adaptations, and in particular that the food reward, extra flow and trees, are tropical adaptations, and that the mite rewards, um, the housing reward, were temperate adaptations. Okay, so here's the phylogeny again, um, and you can see I put temperate and tropical along the top. It doesn't really matter which are which, except, because um, it's kind of hard to see, but just that they're varying, there's multiple different transitions between temperate and tropical across the phylogeny. Okay, so now I'm gonna map on the presence of extra floral nectaries that we saw. Okay, woo. Um, okay, okay, so not that exciting, but uh, extra floral nectaries evolved once in viburnum, we found, and once they evolved, they persisted um, over time. And in fact, they persisted um, despite shifts into and out of the tropics, um, and they, um, they persisted and even got bigger with moves into very northern temperate and boreal places. 
Um, so there's really no evidence within this group that there's strong selection for these things to be temp or tropical adaptations, although it is um, just one clade. Okay, great. There they are. Oh, that's an example of these really northern boreal um, extrafloral nectaries that have gotten really big and honking and tropical looking, even though um, they're, not, they're not tropical. Okay. So here's the same phylogeny, but instead of um, extrafloral nectaries, I have mitomatia um, mapped on. And what you can see right away is that for this housing reward, it's sort of blinking on and off more across the phylogeny. Um, and when we look at that blinking on and off, we see that overall, um, there was a, a correlation with, temperate, with temperateness. They were more likely to be gained in temperate lineages and less likely to be lost in, um, in temperate lineages. Yeah. Okay, so um, that was really exciting because it, it was consistent with the hypothesis. But when we started looking more closely, we saw that this was really dependent on like what form of domatia we were looking at. Um, and there was no ecological hypotheses about these different forms of domatia, but the phylogeny was kind of telling us that something interesting might be going on. Um, and in particular, it was telling us, it was showing us that there was a really strong pattern that um, convergently over and over there were these beards in the north in temperate deciduous forests and these pits in, when you move towards tropical evergreen forests. Um, like multiple times across the phylogeny. So we're interested in this pattern now um, because it's sort of this unexplained convergent evolution of a mutualism that nobody's looked at. Um, and we're trying to sort of pull out different climactic, climactic niches that, um, or climactic axes that can explain this pattern a little bit better to generate some hypotheses. One that's really clear is um, temperature seasonality. So if you look at temperature seasonality of the different viburnum species, you can see that tough domatia tend to be in seasonal habitats um, repeatedly and that they sort of transition towards these pits um, in the tropical habitats with these cave forms kind of in the middle. Um, caves are like ha sort of like half a pit. Yeah. <clears throat> so we can sort of quantify this pattern a little bit more um, uh, continuously rather than binning it into temperate and tropical. So. Um, then we decided to see like how pervasive this was because we started to get an inkling that this might be a more common trend. Um, and so we wanted to know like, well, does this pan out um, even broad, more broadly across the tree of life? And so we started collecting data on um, the taxonomy and evolutionary distribution of mite domatia just generally across plants. Um, and we found they're present in you know, over 2,000 species that are in, you know, over th in 33 orders. So if I put them on this vascular plant phylogeny in blue, um, where each tip is a family here, you can see they pop up in a bunch of families across the tree of life. Once we get um, into the region of, of trait space where there um, are no longer parallel veins, so when you have vein axles, they, um, then it's very common to evolve these domatia from mites. <clears throat> and we can take that giant data set and see where those lineages are. So here I've just mapped phylogenetic diversity of plants with mite domatia on into a map. So you can see areas um, that pop up as having lots of distantly related lineages that have evolved this trait, so convergence in this trait. Um, and you can split them out by type. And when we do that, across this whole big data set, we see the same pattern, where there are beards in the, so in the north, and there are these pits in the south. And we don't know why this is happening, but we think it's really cool. And I'm interested if you have any ideas, um, because it's a really clear, you know, previously unexplored example um, of large-scale latitudinal convergence um, in a widespread mutualistic trait, which I think just gives us the opportunity to ask questions about the evolution of mutualism in something that's divorced from these ant systems, um, these ant domatia systems, which have only evolved in the tropics um, and not that many times. So I'm really excited about that. Okay. Okay, now on to the second hypothesis here. Um, which is that mutualistic defensive traits are costly and redundant and should trade off over a macroevolutionary time. All right, so here are those same phylogenies, um, same phylogeny but the different traits mapped on. And you can see right away that they're not trading off, obviously, over evolutionary time. And in fact, like if we look, we see that maybe they're e positively evolutionarily correlated. Um, or if you're a branch in the extrafloral nectary clade, you're more likely to have mite domatia than if you're a branch in the non-extrafloral nectary clades. So here are some examples of plants that have both. There's a lot of them across the phylogeny. 
So this led us to think like, okay, well maybe extra floral nectaries and mitomatia are not redundant. Like we had this ecological hypothesis, we looked for it on the phylogeny, we see something else, so now we're gonna see if um, maybe they're not ecologically redundant. Like maybe they're neutral to one another, or maybe in this clade it's better to have both um, than to just have one. So what we did was this experiment um, where we asked whether leaves with extra floral nectaries had more mutualists than um, with leaves with extra floral nectaries and domatia, with food and housing, had more mutualists than leaves with just one reward or the other. Uh, and we did this by putting out plants in a common garden and factorially blocking um, the reward traits with tar. So you can basically exclude uh, the food reward or the housing reward um, and count the mutualists that appear on the leaf. So we did, this on, on, um, we did this on 16 different species and we continuously find the same thing. So I'm gonna show you one native population, one native group from around here, Viburnum acerifolium. And the mutualists I'm gonna show you are mites. So here we have um, a plant that naturally has extra floral nectaries and domatia, food and housing, um, and the factorial blockings um, on the x-axis. Okay, so if you block all the rewards, you have about um, two mutualistic mites running around your leaf. If you allow them to have food or housing, um, then you get about like four or six mites per leaf. So if these traits are redundant, then we expect if we allow both traits to be present, you won't get a, b a bump in the number of mites. You should just um, have this extra cost, but no additional mutualists. Um, and if they're, um, yeah, okay. Okay, so, are you excited to know what we saw? <laughs> okay, so this is what we saw. So we saw um, that if you have um, food and housing, that you have more mutualistic mites than if you just have one versus the other in, a, in an additive way. And we also can show that the more mites that you have, the lower fungal abundance you have on your leaf in these systems. So it does matter for, um, for the fungal load of the plant leaf. Okay, so I named this hypothesis the bed and breakfast hypothesis um, in the, my paper, and, I, um, and they made me take it out of the title, but I still got it in the paper. Um, <laughs> and uh, the idea is that food and housing rewards are ecologically, additively beneficial, and that might be leading to their evolutionary correlation um, over macroevolutionary time, so over like this huge amount of time. Pretty cool. Here's a picture of a plant, a viburnum with both. Um, and you can see, this, thing, this is similar to the one I showed you before, but um, you can see why we focused on these ant traits, these ant things before. Um, this is a, a situation where the extra floral nectaries we think are really targeted towards ants, but the mite domatia are up in the left, upper left, um, and you can see they're just like, they're very important for the plant, but they're very small, so we've kind of ignored them ecologically. And focused on the charismatic megafauna. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. So um, they're not um, trading off over evolutionary time and we don't think they're ecologically redundant. Okay, great. I'm trying to rush so I can get to the orchid bees. <laughs> um, so the third hypothesis that I wanna tell you about is that these traits increase lineage diversification rates over time, that they're sort of key innovations, novel defense, um, Ehrlich and Raven style key innovations. Okay, so here are those um, phylogenies again. So now what I'm gonna show you is um, just a, a log lineage through time plot. So here we have um, time on the x-axis and the number of accruing lineages on the y-axis. So if, if lineages are accruing quickly, you'll have a steep slope, and if they're accruing slowly, you'll have a, um, a, a, a more flat line. And I'm gonna show you two lines on here. I'm gonna show you the tree split up to the, to the part of the tree that has extra floral nectaries and doesn't. So um, a case where these um, traits our increasing lineage diversification rates would be the part of the tree that has um, extra floral nectaries would have a steeper slope than the part without. Okay, um, and so that's what we saw when we looked at viburnum. We saw that um, when extra floral nectaries are present, they're accruing lineages at a faster rate than when extra floral nectaries are absent, consistent with these traits being sort of ecological key innovations. We did the same thing for domatia and we did not see this pattern. So we see that um, domatia start to accruing lineages earlier in time, but they're accru they have similar slopes, so they're accruing lineages at the, about the same rate. Okay, so this is just like a pattern that you can look at, like looking at the data. It's not a formal test, um, but when I saw this, I was like pretty dubious. I was like, I don't know, is that like really driven by extra floral nectaries? 
Um, and that's because there's kind of this like problem with doing these single clay diversification rate studies or this limitation. Um, and that's that like, okay, there might be a correlation between my pet trait and an increase in diversification rate, um, but at any given node, lots of other things are happening because we're talking about huge time scales here and lots of change. Um, and so um, I was like, okay, so it could just be any other thing that changed at that single node on that phylogeny um, about the biology of this clade. So one way that you deal with that is to try and get replication across clades. Um, so in some cases, you can't do this but, um, because you've only had one evolutionary event, like flowers or something, and that's okay. That's still like information that we want. Um, but in some lucky cases, you have a trait that's evolved repeatedly, and you can repeatedly ask whether um, the trait is associated with increased diversification rates. So you can basically do a correlation with a higher n than one. <clears throat> so I wanted to do this. Um, with extra floral nectaries because I was like, ah, oh, it's probably not, it's probably not those. So, um, so to start, I wanted to know like, okay, how many plant lineages have this food reward across all of vascular plants? Um, so to do that, I contacted this um, professor emeritus, Dr. Keeler from University of Nebraska, and she's been keeping this list of plants with extra floral nectaries for um, like her entire career. And I contacted her to see if I could map it on a phylogeny, and she was like, I'm retired and I now like travel around the world giving people like botany tours of gardens and just like take this list because it's a burden. Like, I don't want it. And so now I like own this database. Um, so you can check it out if you haven't already. Uh, extrafloralnectaries.org, super popular website. Um, but it has a bunch of information about all the plants that we know um, that have extra floral nectaries, where they are, what if there's ecological data, stuff like that. So it's a great resource. Um, if you want to study these things. Okay, so when you do that, um, you can uh, map that database on the phylogeny after correcting for taxonomy and stuff, just like we did with Domitia. And we find, um, uh, oh yeah, we found that they're present in about 4,000 species, so more than Domitia, and 500 genera, and 108 plant families. So like these are no rinky-dink trait here. Um, these have evolved many times. Okay, so I'm gonna map it on here. Um, in red, and so what we find is that extra floral nectaries have popped up all over the angiosperm tree of life. Um, and in fact, there's uh, cases of extra floral nectaries in ferns um, evolving, which is kind of silly because they don't have flowers, so there's, it's kind of funny to call them extra floral, um, but they've popped up all over. <clears throat> okay, so at this like super broad scale, um, we look to see whether families that have extra floral nectaries have more species um, in them than families that don't. And we do see a pattern where families with this ant defensive trait, or this defensive bodyguard defensive trait, not just ants, um, have more um, species per million years for their age than families without. Um, however, this still isn't that compelling of evidence because uh, this could be a sampling effect where we're just more likely to see, um, to see a trait in a, a bigger clade. Um, and we're so zoomed out here that it's really hard to have an association between the origin of the trait and a change, a shift in diversification rate at this scale. Um, but what it did allow us to do uh, is to pick out lineages that we could zoom in and test whether there is a correlation in those clades between um, the origin of the trait and a shift in the generation of biodiversity. So here's Viburnum the family's viburnum. Um, and so what we did was we picked five other clades across the tree of life um, that have, you know, independently evolved this tree. Okay, here they are. Um, they're from, uh, they're six different clades from six different orders. They have very different biologies, but they've all um, have variation in the presence or absence of extra floral nectaries. So we then reconstructed their phylogenies and reconstructed the trait using um, herbarium specimens and species descriptions, et cetera. And, um, and then we did a bunch of diversification rate analyses at that scale, so a more nuanced scale. Um, we did at the time Bissy and BAM. Um, now, we haven't done it with Hissy yet, but I think that would be really interesting. Um, uh, but this sort of combined approach we really liked because it allowed us to ask um, whether extra floral nectary clades had higher overall net diversification, but it also sort of allowed us to ask where shifts occur relative to the origin of extra floral nectaries, um, if they are associated. So I'm just gonna show you the punchline here um, from the Bissy analyses, but um, 
uh, here's what we find in viburnum. So here the, the net diversification rate estimates um, with extra floral nectaries are in red and without extra floral nectaries are in black. Um, so it's a higher net diversification rate with the trait, with, with bodyguard defense than without. This shouldn't surprise you because I showed you these data with the lineage through time, time um, plot. This is just sort of another way of um, looking at that same pattern right now. So um, now I'm gonna show you the data for the other clave. Um, and so this is what we found. So I was like pretty uh, actually surprised that we found this repeated pattern across these clades where clades with extra floral nectaries did tend to have higher net diversification rates than clades without them. When we did the BAM analyses and, and started to tease things apart with the biology of these clades, we found a pattern where extra floral nectary clades were more likely to have sort of downstream radiation events. So it wasn't like there was a um, uh, like one-to-one matchup between you get the trait and there's this burst of diversification. It was like you get the trait and then there's this lag and then you have a you have bursts of diversification within that. So um, so that's kind of like an interesting thing to think about with trying to understand the mechanism by which this trait is supposed to help um, increase lineage diversification. Okay, great. So here's the research summary for this first part. How am I doing on time? Oh, good. Okay, so. Um, I showed you that um, Domitia macroevolution is consistent with this geographical adaptation hypothesis, that they're temperate um, adaptations, but only for one type of Domitia. There seems to be this signature of Domitia form. Um, and we didn't find any evidence so far for extra floral nectaries as tropical adaptations. We found that um, extra floral nectaries and Domitia, food and housing, were positively evolutionarily correlated across the tree and ecologically additive um, in terms of their benefit. And we found that um, extra floral nectaries, but not Domitia, were associated with increased lineage diversification rates or support for this key innovation hypothesis. Okay, great. So, um, so I'm working on this, these types of traits a lot. So um, the future directions for this in the lab is, um, we just got this dimensions and biodiversity grant that I told you about, but we're, we're now shifting to study the um, evolution of mite domitia across vitus, or wild grapes. Um, so uh, my technician in the lab was here all week actually measuring a bunch of your grape plants. Uh, Caroline is right there um, for these traits, so that's pretty exciting. So this grant is looking to sort of uncover this um, hidden mutualism that's sort of in front of us and try and develop it as a model system for understanding the evolution of, of mutualism and linking ecology and evolution. And it has three parts. Um, I'm just gonna briefly show them to you so you know what I'm up to in case you want to talk. The first is to um, look at the macroevolutionary patterns of trait evolution in vitus, and test some of these same hypotheses there. Then we're gonna um, look at the causes, uh, the consequences of this trait in different ecosystems for um, diversity on the leaf, or how, if, you, if a plant has them or doesn't have them, um, what happens to the phylosphere of that community, um, and how that affects selection on the leaf. And then um, we're trying to understand the genetic basis of mite domitia in grapes because there's a ton of genetic resources um, for this trait in that system. Okay, great. Okay, I have um, a little bit of time, so I'm gonna briefly tell you uh, about orchid bees. Um, this will be short, but I just had to squeeze it in because it's Valentine's Day and there's such a good system for talking about on Valentine's Day. Okay, so these, this is in collaboration with um, Santiago Ramirez and Thomas Elts, two orchid bee biologists. Here's the good news about orchid bees. So orchid bees are um, a group of bees closely related to honeybees um, that have caught the imagination of lots of people. Charles Darwin wrote about them in his most famous book, The Various Contrivances by Which Orchids Are Fertilized by Insects. Um, and he was fascinated by their color and by their interactions with orchids. But what he didn't know was that um, orchid bees are the only species other than humans that collect and construct perfumes from their environment. So they're kind of male orchid bees are hardwired um, to collect scents, scents from the environment, different scent blends, um, and store them in their hind tibia pocket, this like specialized pocket, and then they release those perfume blends during mating displays, um, and females come. So um, I have a video. Let's see if it works. Okay, so here's a male orchid bee. It's collecting scents with its forelegs with these specialized brushes. Um, so any type of volatile scent. Um, uh, it could collect, but it collects certain ones. And then it's in flight, storing them in its hind tibia pockets, um, transferring, creating this blend in there, and then flying away um, to do this 
mating display later where it can really, so it'll fly away and be charged up for a long time. Okay, so perfumes. Um, so they are these traits that mediate sexual signaling in this group. Um, so this like species recognition trait. So, um, uh, so these orchid bees, they're the only pollinators of some orchids and orchids have evolved um, these scents to give as rewards for the plant. Um, so they, they, the orchids are evolutionarily dependent on attracting the, the um, orchid bees to them for pollination. Okay, so they're under strong selective pressure to attract these bees by providing scents that they like. However, um, we know that the orchid bees um, are not limited to the orchids for the scents they get. In fact, they collect scents from all over the Amazon, um, from all sorts of flowers, from like feces, from lichens, from all sorts of things. So um, their, the evolution of their scent preferences or what scents they collect is not tied to orchids. So it's led to this um, question, which is what are sort of the macroevolutionary patterns of the perfume um, across the genus? So this is the, um, the, the project that I've been working on. So, um, <clears throat> okay, so because they're sexual signaling traits, we have a couple of macroevolutionary predictions about how they might evolve. First, we think that they should be highly species specific. Um, uh, second, we think that they should have rapid divergence among close relatives. Um, and third, we thought um, that they, we would see divergence among species, close relatives that managed to coexist with each other to uh, um, avoid reproductive interference, things like that. Okay, so, um, so we set out to look for that. We asked whether macroevolutionary patterns supported the elevated rates of perfume evolution compared to other traits. Um, and we also asked whether coexistence with close relatives of orchid bees is associated with the evolution of more complex or novel um, perfumes or perfume divergence. Okay, so um, we collected um, orchid bees from all over, uh, well, from many places in South and Central America. And you do that by putting out a bait for them with a scent, and then they come to the bait, and then you can pick them up um, and take them home and <laughs> extract the perfume from their, um, uh, from their tibia. Okay, great. So we had 639 bees from 65 species. And the first thing that we saw was we did see very high species specificity. So no matter where an individual was in the, in the environment, they could be very far away, some of these species. They were still collecting the same things. Um, so they were sort of hardwired to collect the same scent blends. So they were making the same perfume. And those perfumes were very complex. So we found 762 different perfume compounds in their blends. So here you have the species we looked at and then the presence or absence of um, the compounds in their blend. And I'm showing you presence or absence, but we analyze this in a relative abundance way. Okay, so for the first question, whether they showed elevated rates of evolution compared to non-signaling traits, um, uh, we compared the evolution of this perfume, like their perfume preferences, to some other traits, they, um, to a chemical trait, which is um, their labial gland chemistry in their mouth, um, to, and then to like some morphological traits. And what we found was um, a very different pattern between the perfumes and the other traits we looked at. So here we have um, disparity through time plots. And what it shows you is how different the different um, clades are through time So for the different traits. So for perfume signaling, we see that close relatives um, in this black line, the big black line, remain very divergent, remain to have high disparity through time. So even close relatives have very high disparity in their perfumes. Um, and we didn't see that for the other traits. So if you look at perfume evolution on the phylogeny, you can kind of see this reflected. You can see that over evolutionary time, you see this splitting sort of shallowly in the tree um, where close relatives have very different perfume chemistries. They go to very different parts of perfume space. Um, okay, great. So it fit this kind of increasing rates model of evolution where the more orchid bees there were in, the, um, in Central and South America, the more divergent these things were going in chemical space. So that sort of brought us to our next question, um, which was whether coexistence in close relatives predicted some of these evolutionary rates. Um, if you exist with a lot of other orchid bee species, are you evolving a more um, insane perfume preference? Uh, okay, so we reconstructed the ranges of these orchid bee species, and we calculated range overlap. Um, between all the pairs. 
So we were able to get um, these measures of, for each species of orchid bee, how many congeners does it overlap with in its range? Does it overlap with none or a couple or like 30 other orchid bee species? And does that predict how um, diverse and how novel its um, perfume is? And we found um, indeed that the more orchid other congeners you overlap with, the more complex your um, perfume is, the more compounds are in it, and the more unique it is, the more compounds that nobody else has on the process of phylogeny you have. So it looks like the, this is consistent with, the, with coexistence driving the evolution of more and more novel signal preferences. Um, okay, great. So I have some more data but, um, about that last question, but I'm not gonna show you because it's too, it's too late. So I'm just gonna slip through it, sorry. Okay. So in conclusion for this part, oh wow, orchid bees are so great, happy Valentine's Day. Um, also, um, perfume signaling is really species specific um, in this group, uh, even across large geographic distances. Um, it had sort of elevated rates of evolution through time and um, coexistence with close relatives was associated with the evolution of more novel phenotypes. Um, okay, so I hope that um, through that wild ride of mutualism, uh, uh, I convinced you that even though it can be challenging to link species interactions and macroevolution, there's still a lot of work we can do, especially if we merge contemporary um, patterns of trait function with macroevolutionary patterns of trait evolution and try and um, have those two scales talk to each other. Um, yeah. And with that, um, I'd like to thank my funding sources and thank all of you for being with me here today. <clears throat> Yeah, that's a great question. No, it does not. It's um, uh, mostly, um, there's not eusociality in the orchid bee. The, the females range from being um, completely solitary to living with like one or two other females where one is um, dominant and eats the other's eggs. <laughs> so it's like a little bit of model system for the study of the development of sociality. Um, but by and large, they're not social. So the males will be flying around collecting perfumes and then the females, um, will come out and mate once, um, and then it, then go, go lay their eggs. Yeah. Yeah. Microphone. Oh, sorry. I should repeat the question. I'm sorry. Believe it or not, it actually is. Can you speak into it? <laughs> I feel like this is about to explode into snakes or something. And, um, Thank you, th th thank you for the talk. Uh, based off that question, I'm curious, is, is there different rates of diversification or different degrees of disparity between the perfumes between the orchids that, that show some communal living and the ones that are purely solitary? Yeah, that's an active area of research in um, one of the orchid bee labs that I work with. Um, and I don't, we don't know the answer yet. It's been really hard to learn how to um, rear the females. So it's been like very difficult to ask those questions, uh, but we just like had this breakthrough where we made these. So there's been this colonization event of Florida um, that none of the orchid bee biologists are responsible for, and we aren't like happy about it. But um, also, it's like really convenient. <laughs> so we built these flight cages in Florida to study the um, orchid bee that's uh, colonized there, and um, we've just gotten females to mate in that giant flight cage. So I think now we're able to start asking some of those questions, but the female um, biology has been a big missing part of the orchid bee story for a very long time. Um, and they're a really classic you know, group for these questions, so I think that'll be cool to ask. Yeah. Oh, I forgot, I keep forgetting. <clears throat> okay, hi. So um, I'm really curious about this idea of the the EFNs, um, the extra floral nectaries, and the domatia like trading off because they're costly traits, um, but they actually have additive like separate ben benefit, which is really interesting. So, um, what kind of benefit are they providing? Like, are they providing different types of benefit, and is it to like vegetative growth rate, or you know, what are those types of benefits, and then what are the relative costs of yeah, those things? Yeah, that's a Do great you have any question. Ideas? Yeah, the, um, 
so the benefit that, um, uh, do you mean to the benefit to the plant? You yeah, to the plant. Yeah, the benefit to the plant is um, reduced damage, which, you know, if you, if there's an outbreak of, of something means increased fitness. If there's no outbreak, if there's no enemy pressure, um, then it means you're losing um, resources, like you're losing sugar to a bodyguard, but not, you don't have anything, you know, eating you. So you're getting, um, uh, you're losing resources, but not getting any benefit. So there's a context dependency in the benefit. Um, the cost for exoflow and nectaries are sh is sugar, carbon. The cost for mitomatia, um, it looks like on plants that don't have mites, but do have mitomatia. So you have the house, but no one's living in it. Um, you have higher fungal load mm -hmm. on your leaves than um, if you didn't have the house at all. And I think that's because these hairs um, are just like trapping spores. So if the mites are there, then it's great. But if the mites aren't there, um, then you have this like extra hairiness that's not providing another like physiological or defensive role to the plant and is just a cost with trapping spores. And so the funguses are pathogens? Presumably? Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, part of what we're interested in looking at it the, is is the fungal community response. So people have studied these things with like, in a pairwise way with um, fungi that are bad, like powdery mildew, which you know are bad. They decimate um, grape, grape vines, they do all sorts of bad things. And mites will eat down the powdery mildew. So if you take the mites away from a wild grape plant around here, like a riparia, and it, and give, and it experiences powdery mildew, like it will die. Um, but we know that not all fungi are bad, um, and so what, but we do know that like mediating the fungal community on the leaf is what makes these things um, beneficial. So what I think is happening is that mites are like, um, this is my working hypothesis, that mites are like sheep and they're grazing down the phylosphere community of microbes in a way that creates like a low abundance, high diversity community um, and is not very invasible. So they make this sort of intermediate disturbance um, non-invasible place. So I think that they're just grazing down everything and making a more stable community on the leaf, which is selectively beneficial for the plant um, because things like powdery mildew can't outbreak. There's no competitive dominance of powdery mildew. So that's sort of the crux of the um, way that we want to use these traits to link ecology and evolution. Like the, the multi-trophic multi ecological interactions on this world that is the leaf is what leads to this convergent pattern of evolution across the tree, which is the tree of life, which is like pretty, um, pretty neat. But we need, do need to like test the links to make sure it's working the way we think it's working. Um, so that's part of what we're trying to understand. Really cool. Yeah. So, so you, you've kind of got a story where you've got at two levels, you've got at the, at the you know, population level, you either have a fitness benefit to mutualisms in both senses, maybe sometimes it's kind of neutral, but on the whole, it definitely seems to be very positive, right? Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, at the macroevolutionary scale, you have a clear advantage in terms of lineage versus mutation rates. So why is it the case that not all plants are saturated with like mutualisms that are actually defensive or otherwise providing some benefit? Yeah, well, one of the things, I mean, I, I ask myself that every morning when I wake up. Um, I'm, I don't know, I think, um, with chemical defenses, we think it's kind of different, like a plant will evolve a chemical defense and then it could be really beneficial for a while until insects or herbivores evolve resistance and or evolve to sequester it and use it as their own, to their own benefit. So the selective benefit would go down over time um, and in different contexts. And stuff. But for these bodyguard mutualisms, um, it's less clear like how they would be bad. Um, it, but one thing we're really excited to do is use the gain and loss of mitomatia across wild grapes, because they have been lost in wild grapes repeatedly, to try and understand when they're, like, when they're selectively beneficial and when they're not, like what context, what ecological context, what like, um, context in terms of other traits that the plant has make them beneficial and when not, um, and then try and use that to understand when we might be able to use these in vineyards because right now we spray the crap out of our plants with sulfur, which kills um, both powdery mildew and the mites. Um, people don't really like the idea of like mites and wine, so I need to think of like a cool, like hip thing, a <laughs> hip word other than like mites. Um, so you can think of one. A cara wine or something, I don't know. It's, I don't know, <laughs> wine without pesticides, I guess, or wine without sulfur. Um, but uh, it's clearly context dependent in some way because it keeps being lost. Um, Right? Is that a, I, that's what I'm assuming. So there's some must be some trade-off. 
And I don't really understand fully the link between um, the evolution of, of a defense and increased divers lineage diversification rates. And that's something that I really would like to understand because I'd like to test some of the mechanistic you know, links, microevolutionary links and stuff in between. Um, but I don't understand them. And so, and I think, um, n I don't think anyone really does. And the more I think about it, the more I think, well, maybe it's not, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, I'm not sure how it works. That's an open research question that people are excited about, including me. So do you have a hypothesis of why that would be? Yeah, because if you closed your eyes and, and I just told you about the system, I, I mean, I would have guessed that there'd be more Dimatia in the tropics because leaves are around for longer and they're more of like a developed ecosystem um, and they get dirtier, you know, over time. They get more fungal epiphytes and stuff over time. So you might need them more. Um, and in temperate regions, they seem to be much more common. It's a very common defense around here, even though they, people haven't really paid attention to it. Um, and I don't know why that is. The mites, yeah. The other thing is we only find uh, mite damage in woody plants. Um, and I don't know why that is. The mites overwinter in the bark. So you'd think, okay, maybe that explains why they're only in woody plants in the temperate regions. But in the tropics, they're also only in woody plants. So there's something about being a woody plant that makes this type of defense um, feasible or beneficial, and a, particularly a temperate woody plant. But yeah, I don't know. Do you have any ideas? Okay. <laughs> So for both of your case studies, you showed a lot of evolutionary patterns for one part of the mutualism, but not the other. And I was wondering, do you expect that there would be, for example, with extrafloral nectaries, that you'd find any kind of parallel evolutionary patterns in, say, the ant mutualists? Yeah. Or likewise for the orchids and the bees? That's a great question. Um, for the ants, there's two papers um, that are either completely out or on bioarchive or whatever, asking whether the reverse is true for the um, key innovation thing, like whether visiting extra floral nectaries um, increases your diverse lineage diversification rate if you're an ant. Um, and they also look at whether living in ant domatia increases your lineage diversification rate. And they find that um, extra floral nectaries, like feeding on extra floral nectaries does seem to increase the lineage, be associated with increased lineage diversification rate for ants, um, but not living in ant domatia. That seems to be a specialized thing that is um, potentially limiting their, you know, success. Success. Um, and then uh, for the orchids and orchid bees, that's a really cool system. It was. It used to be like this great system for coevolution, mm -hmm. and now it seems really clear that it's this unidirectional thing where the orchids are under tremendous pressure to like keep the orchid bees interested. Um, and it'd be really cool to look at like community coexistence of the orchids. Because um, they, you know, are dealing with their own need to not hybridize and get orchids to visit them and attract them and stuff. So um, I'm sure there's some really cool things you could do with looking at community patterns um, with the orchids and the orchid bees. But we just don't know a lot about the orchids yet. So that's a that's sort of we know a lot about the bees and not about the orchids. For the mites, that's the last one. They um, we know like nothing about mites in general. I think I mean comparatively to other branches of the tree of life, it's just one of those like remarkably diverse and remarkably understudied clays, which is part of what I like about them. Like, there's such cool natural history that we can find out in our backyards. But we know very little about the mites that live in the Domitia. Um, we know, like, what families they're in. We know what they eat, roughly. Um, but nobody's looked for, like, phylogenetic patterns on that side or even, like, I mean, basic, like, natural history experiments. I think it'd be a really great system for, um, like, ecology field classes and stuff because you can really manipulate them and bring them in. Um, so long as, I mean, the one thing is that mite identification is really hard, so if you could get some sort of barcoding thing going or something, um, then it would be great. But yeah, um, but I'd love to know more about that side of it, but we just don't know yet. Okay, well, we're about out of 